Good evening, good day, good afternoon. Welcome to those of you that are tuning in at this time to be a part of this moment. And I want to remind you that as you tune in to be a part of this moment, there must be an expectation. There must be a certain attitude of faith in order for you to tap into what the Lord has already put in place for you to experience. We read in the Bible about Jesus when he was here in his body on the earth. There was, an, there was a moment that he was passing through a particular town, city, and there was a woman that was diseased in her body. She had a constant bleeding, an issue of blood, the scripture calls it, for 12 years. And during the 12 years, she sought out many physicians. And the scripture said, she got worse. And then she heard about Jesus and based on the information that she got about him, she said, if I only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. An attitude of faith. And when Jesus was passing by, and the scripture tells us that she pressed because there was a crowd around him, thronging him, and because of her faith, her attitude of faith, because she could have looked at the circumstance and said, you know what, I'm sick, I've been losing blood for how long, I'm dying and, and, and I'm weak. When she come out and saw the crowd that was thronging Jesus, but because of her faith, that attitude of faith, she pressed. And in our walk with God, to experience the things that God has put in place for us. The enemy always have different types of crowds, crowds of doubt and fear and name it. The list is long that is going to show up in a given moment that you're supposed to experience, that you're supposed to hear the voice of the Father, that you're supposed to experience his presence or whatever it is that he has put in place for even this day, a day that we have never seen before, a day that we will never see again. And what is it that he had put in place for you and I to experience, but there is crowd that is around, that the enemy is put in place to enter us, but we have got to have that attitude of faith like the woman and press. Don't let the crowd cause you to turn back. Don't let the crowd cause you to give up and say, you know what, I, I, I am okay. No. If God has ordained and established for you to experience it, it is important. And for him to receive glory daily, moment by moment, and day by day from your life. Because when you fail to come into what God has put in place for you, then God failed to receive glory. There is no glory that is going to him from that which he put in place for you to experience. And so I'm saying all of that to say this, that as we come to be a part of this moment, there must be an attitude of faith to hear, to receive, and to experience what the Father wants you and I to come into. And the woman pressed, as we know, and she pressed, and she pressed, and she kept on encouraging herself by saying, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And when she touched, immediately 
her fountain of blood was dried up. And Jesus said, somebody touch me. And you think of it that in, in this crowd, there was a lot of bouncing up. There was a lot of touching that was already taking place. But this was a, a, a touch of faith, a faith touch. That Jesus said, somebody touch me. Peter said, Lord, look at the crowd. So he knows that it's impossible for somebody not to touch him. Peter said, Lord, look at the crowd and you're saying somebody touch. Jesus said, I'm not talking about somebody just touching me. I'm talking about someone deliberately, on purpose, by faith, touch me. Who is it? And the woman trembling came and identified herself. And Jesus said, go your way, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you whole. What is it that you're, you have been experiencing, that woman was experiencing bleeding for 12 years? What is it that you have been experiencing? Maybe for more than 12 years, maybe it's 12 years, maybe it's months or, you know, weeks or days or whatever and this is the moment that God has now put things in place for you to experience your healing, your deliverance, your freedom, your breakthrough and whatever it is that you have need of and if you don't show up with that attitude of faith, the crowd will cause you to miss it. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord. It's a day that we have never seen before and it's one that we will never see again. Thank you that you daily load it this moment, this day for us to experience benefits from heaven. Thank you for the daily bread that you have put in place for us to experience. Thank you for your people. I pray, Father, in this moment, as I give myself to your spirit, as I give myself to speak as an oracle of God, that those who have an ears to hear, they will hear. And whatever it is that is happening, Father, in their lives, in any form, in any way, shape or form, that they will experience your healing, your, your, your touch, miracles, whatever they're, they're, they're in need of. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that, Father, those who are in need of peace, comfort, joy, strength, hope, whatever, Father, I pray that they will experience that even as they watch, even as they watch. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the, 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 the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Spirit being sent and coming. And he came. He's here. Thank you for him being here and thank you for the purpose for which he came, the positions that he has been given and sent into and the functions that come from those positions. And it's all for the body of Christ. It's all for the saints. It's all for the sons. May we experience it. May we receive the Holy Spirit afresh. May we, may we receive the Holy Spirit. May we be filled with the Spirit. May we be filled with the Spirit afresh. Father, thank you for hearing and thank you for answering as the Spirit rests upon us in wisdom and in revelation. In the name of Christ, your Son. Amen. I want to share with those of us who are of course, I'm sharing it with every you know, person that is a part of the body of Christ. Wherever you are, the scripture tells us um, that we should pray for all saints. Um, so saints we personally you know, know, saints we don't personally know, but we know that there are saints across the world. And as we pray and understand how we should pray, then we know that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Make tremendous power available. Um, for those of us in, 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 in Canada here and as a part of this immediate congregation would know some of the names of these persons that I would mention um, that throughout the past week or so, um, there is Brother Michael um, Reynos, 
is in the hospital at the present moment, so I am putting it out there for us to um, join faith and prayer in regards to what is happening so that he will experience the healing provision that the Father has already put in place for him. There is uh, Brother Roland um, and um, Sister Merle, Merlin. She was in the hospital, I think, maybe for a day or so. She's back home now. Um, but um, her husband, Brother Roland, is still in the hospital. And, and based on the restrictions and stuff like that that is in place right now, um, they, they're not even allowing anybody to visit and so on. So our priors, they can stop. They can't restrict your faith and they cannot restrict your prior. So as we pray, we know that God, who hears and answers prayer, he cannot be stopped either from going where they are because he's always there and to bring about the manifestation of that which he has already put in place. And um, I have, as I spoke with, um, of, of course, I spoke with Sister Merle, I spoke with Brother Michael, I spoke with his wife, uh, of course, prayed with them. There is also Brother Clive that was in the hospital. Um, I think he's still there. I think um, for nearly a month, I think it's tomorrow that he should be released. He has gotten better. I called him at the beginning when I heard that he was there, prayed with him and so on. So he's, he has gotten better. They, so they're supposed to release him tomorrow um, according to plans. Um, there is... Uh, I think of, uh, I, I, I'd go back to even um, Sister Christine Older, that um, her mom passed earlier on uh, a few months back, and then I think there was a brother that also passed um, after that. Then we had a Sister Yvette Cruz, her mom passed. Um, then there is Sister Shernet. Um, um, she had some loved one passing too. I'm, I'm not sure if his mom or daughter or something, but she also. So keep these individual in prayer. And then there is Sister Charlene Brown. Her dad also passed. And so we continue to keep these people in prayer and continue to believe that the grace, the God of all grace, the God of all comfort, the God of all hope will continue to strengthen them, give them the necessary peace that they need in these times as they face situation in life that brings, you know, a, a, a certain um, uh, moment of grief and, and pain. But with the grace of God, they will be able to face it and deal with it differently from how the world would deal with it. They don't have to experience depression. They don't have to experience despair. But they can experience the peace of God that passes all human understanding. And what I've shared is, is what I've known, is what information has come to me. If so, if there is anyone else that is out there and there is anything, if I, I don't get that information, I couldn't say, I don't know, unless the Spirit reveal otherwise. So if you're there, we continue to believe and pray also that you will tap into the grace of the living God and experience what you should experience dealing with life circumstances, but dealing with it differently, dealing with it on a different plane, dealing with it from a different world, and functioning in this world, knowing that we're in it, but we're not of it. And so we deal with things differently. Father, I thank you again for your grace, and I thank you for your people and all these persons that have mentioned their names. I thank you for your continued grace. I thank you for your continued peace, strength, provision, and whatever they have need of, I thank you for your continued uh, presence abiding with them because you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. In Christ's name, your son, I thank you and we receive. Amen. I want to continue to talk about the kingdom of God. 
And the reason why that is important for preachers who are sent by Christ to continue to talk about the kingdom of God, because that's what God is, that's what God is about. That's what he has established. And that's why he has even raised up preachers and sent them to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The example of that was perfectly established and set when the Lord Jesus Christ himself manifested in time. John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, we know that based on his assignment, he went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And as he was baptizing based on his assignment, waiting, of course, the baptism was geared towards the Christ, Jesus coming, being the lamb that he would have washed and presented unto Israel, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Because if you notice, the moment Jesus showed up on the scene, not too long after that, John was taken out because he was the forerunner. He was the one that was pre to prepare the way for another to come. The, the, the other that should have come, as we know, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus showed up and John even heard the Pharisees, they came to him bringing news and saying certain things to him about Jesus in John chapter 3. And he said, you know what? I must decrease but he must increase. And so John knew that his, his, his mission was now accomplished once he baptized Jesus, washed him as the lamb, and presented him to be offered up as the living sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. So, I see even after Jesus came, and John preached the kingdom. Jesus came and he continued. The Bible said, when Jesus heard that John was now cast into prison, from that moment on, Jesus began to teach and to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we see in Matthew chapter 3, it started out with John preaching the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4, we see when John is cast into prison. So between Matthew chapter 3 and 4, years roll over. Years rolled over there. And so we get to chapter 4 and Jesus began teaching and preaching the kingdom. We get to chapter 5, Jesus saw the multitude because we heard in chapter 4 when he went about preaching the kingdom, he was healing all kinds of sickness and disease among the people, casting out demons and doing the things that he were doing, setting the captive free. So when the, his fame spread out across the different regions, all the way over into Syria, Lebanon, and so on, the, the crowd, the people came from all these different regions to gather around him. In chapter 5, and seeing the multitude, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him saying, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, hear Jesus, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The church has taken the message of the kingdom lightly. Therefore, we're seeing a lot of light things where the church is concerned because we take God for granted and we take his message for granted that he has given to his son and sent him into earth to set the standard for how the church ought to function. The church is the body of Christ, the body of the king. And if the king himself came in time and was committed to teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom until the very day that he died on the cross and rose from the dead, for 40 days when he rose from the dead and remained in the earth, in the bodily form that he came from the dead, he appeared to the disciples, speaking to them of nothing else but the things concerning the kingdom of God. And he ascended into heaven and told them to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom is integral to the existence of the church. And if the church abandoned the message of the kingdom, the church is abandoning its true purpose and why it is supposed to be here and how it is supposed to function. No wonder we're seeing the church in the state that it's in. And it's time for the church to repent 
and come back to the Christ that has established it and align itself with who Christ is as king and the message that was given to it and the mission that is tied to the message that if you compromise the message, the mission is compromised. The mission is compromised because of the message. So the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom is not to be taken lightly. So in talking about the things concerning the kingdom of God, the Lord has processed and prepared me to talk about this and teach on this message that I've been delivering from January of 2020. It wasn't January of 2020 the Lord gave me this word. The Lord was preparing me for years now in looking at the church. He allowed me to observe a lot of things, see a lot of things, because I thought about it that when I got born again, I came in with, based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, with the intention that, you know, I want to try. Those were the days when you say, you know, you would say, I'm trying. So I'm coming now saying that I want to try and, you know, live a, a, a nice Christian life so that when the Lord Jesus Christ return, at least I would be good enough for him to take me to heaven with him. And little did I know that God had bigger plans than that. And so while I was minding my own business, doing my own little thing, he began to interrupt that and begin to speak to me, begin to show me things. I begin to see things that I thought I had no business seeing. And I begin to even say things that I, I thought I had no business saying and, and started to get myself in trouble with the very denomination that I was a part of. It got to the point where they said that I came to mash up their church. And so they decided that they needed to get rid of me because I came to mash up their church. I'm rocking the boat and doing all the stuff. And there was a lot of things that were said. And even during that time, I still didn't understand, still did not understood the, the magnitude of what is it that God had saved me for? Because I thought that, you know, I, 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 I simply got saved just to miss, you know, hell by the skin of my, 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 my teeth or something like that. And not understanding that God knew about us before the foundations of the world. When we read in Ephesians, it tells us that we were predestined before the foundation of the world to the adoption of sons in Christ Jesus. So it's not after I, got, I, I was born from my mother's womb in the natural, are you, and you came in time, then God, you know, make up his mind to say, oh, I'm going to do this. No, he knew of us before the foundation of the world. He knew of us before we were born. And so when he calls us, we should come into that understanding and realize that he didn't now made a mistake in calling us. It's an purpose it's on purpose and Romans chapter 8 and the verse that we love to quote and taking it out of context and use it in so many ways that it cannot fit into many things that we put it in but we think that it fits but it didn't fit and the verse 28 in Romans chapter 8 says this all things work together for good to them that love God but that's not the ending of the verse it says, to those who are the called according to his purpose. The question is, what is his purpose in calling us? What is his purpose in calling us? And the purpose that God has for us in calling us, that call, is, it didn't start in time. It was before time. So I, I begin to realize now, when God began to do what he started doing in my life and things he was showing me and things that he was saying in and through me, that this was not an accident, it wasn't a coincidence, it was on purpose. God knew of me before the foundation of the world, knew of me before I was born and came from my mother's womb. And so what he had ordained and established for me to come into, he has now activated it for me to step into it and I could be disobedient and reject it and I would pay the price for that. I would suffer the consequences of such. But I choose to obey and don't care the cost because my body is not here to be preserved. 
My body is here to be given over to him as a living sacrifice. So daily it is put at risk for the Lord's sake. He says, if you save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose it for my sake and the kingdom's sake, you will find it. So I'm not here to preserve myself. I am here to give myself over moment by moment, day by day, as a living sacrifice unto the living God so that what he has ordained my life to be from before the foundation of the world, it will be. And the glory that he intend to come from my life, he will not get a part of that glory, but he will get the full glory, the full glory. And that if, if it is within his plans and purpose for my body to expire before he return, like the Apostle Paul, I, sh I, can, I should be able to come to the end of my journey and said, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. And I've fought indeed a good fight. So I am not afraid of persecution. I am not afraid of attack. I'm not afraid of people lying on me, tearing me down, trying to do whatever they want to do. I'm not afraid of that. I am here for God's glory and for God's honor. And one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of ever so often is that the scripture says that all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. You can't escape persecution if you're walking with Christ. You will escape it if you give up walking with Christ. And if you give up walking in Christ, you are already in hell. You are already in hell. But if you stay the course, the scripture promise us that if you are faithful even until death, then a crown of life you will receive. You will receive. So I, am, I honor God and I'm grateful that he has allowed me to come into this and to be a part of the body of Christ and the place and position that you have placed me into be a part of building up, edifying the body of Christ. So I want to continue to talk about the apostle for a little here as we have been looking at this for a little while and continue to lay certain foundations where this is concerned. And last week, I talked about the divine order, the divine established order that God put in place for the church how he would speak to the church, how he would deal with the church. And so, if you haven't gotten that yet, because I remember when I started talking about the apostle in January, coming into February, coming even into the middle, into the first two hours or week of March, there were people that were coming out and the, there are some of them, they had never heard that kind of a teaching before. They had never heard. I'm sure many of them have heard about apostle, but they had never heard someone talking about it like that and for them to even understand the true purpose of an apostle. That an apostle is not somebody who dress up in a frock and have on a big chain and a big ring and call it apostle ring, apostle chain, apostle this and apostle that. All of these things are garbage and foolishness and satanic and demonic because there is no such thing. No, the Bible doesn't do those things. We never see when Christ chose those whom he named apostle, he gave them a ring, he gave them a chain, and he gave them a special kind of clothing. He didn't do that. So where did we get this foolishness from? And then we're now saying that that person is an apostle. So when I begin to look at the scriptures and begin to understand God's order for Israel as a nation, so the previous week before that, if you recall, those of you who have been a part of even the live streaming, and if you weren't, and you went to watch that, that, that which was archived, you heard me spoke about the divine order that God had in place for the children of Israel, how he would speak to them and how he would deal with them in light of them understanding what is the timing or the season so that they would be aware of the economy, 
that is coming from God's presence, God's authority and power that is in support of that season or that timing so that they know exactly what is it that they're supposed to be expecting? What is the manifestation that is supposed to be coming forth as they give themselves to such? So the prophet would come and speak. So we see, based on what we read in Hebrews chapter 1, that God in various, in various times and in various ways, he spoke to our fathers in time past by the prophets. And there are scriptures after scriptures because I said, the few scriptures that I take to show you, it is not meant to exhaust what I'm trying to show you or what I am doing with the help of the Holy Spirit to show you. It's for you now to go and search the scriptures even more and judge if what I say to you, if it is so or not. Look at the principle in Acts chapter 17 with the, Berean, the Bereans how they would come and they would listen to the apostles with a ready mind, a prepared mind, and then they would search the scriptures daily to see if what they heard from the apostles, if it was so or not. And the Bible says as a result of that attitude, that kind of a behavior, many came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as they searched the scriptures, they found out for themselves that what they heard, it was so. It was so. And therefore it transformed their lives. Unlike the church today that is so religious and take the scriptures of the, the, the scripture and the word of God for granted and familiarity with the scriptures has caused us to have to, to not experience the power that the word itself has to bring about the transformation that God wants us to experience. The word of God is still alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It still is. But how many of us who say we're of God experiencing, how many of us are experiencing that power? How many of us are experiencing the life of the word? Because if we don't believe it and give ourselves to it, it will only be something religious for us. And God is not supporting anything that is religious. He's supporting true faith true reliance on who he is and what he says and trusting his ability to do what he says. So I showed you clear evidence in the scriptures, the only divine established order and way in which God spoke to Israel and dealt with Israel. And we see there was three positions where the Old Testament is concerned, we see the king, we see the prophet, and we see the priest. Outside of God, outside of that order, nobody dealt with Israel in any other way, shape, or form where God was concerned. The king represented the rule of God, the kingship of God to Israel. Even though the prophet, of course, recognized God as king. But the prophet was about speaking. The prophet, was, the prophet represented the word of God. The word. When they see the prophet, they're expecting to hear from God. When they listen to the prophet, they know that the prophet is speaking. And so that's why when the prophets speak, we see in the scripture, and they disobeyed it, the judgment that would follow because they're speaking from God. And the priests administrate on the behalf of the people. They stood. The priests, the life of the priest was a life of an intercessor. Right? The way in which the, the priests function. And when I say intercessor, I'm talking about the go-between. They were between the people and God. They were between God and the people. So they administrate on the behalf of the people work to God. And administrate on the behalf of God to the people in receiving sacrifice and offerings from the people offering it up to God and representing the order that God wanted them to be in representing the things concerning him to the people of Israel those were the only three ways and the, one of the main thing that we see that even the kings that God put in place to rule over Israel God spoke to them through the prophet the prophet 
And why this is so important for us as the church to pay attention to it. The church has gotten loose and slack and all over the place. And everybody come talking. Everybody jump up writing books. Everybody come say, God say, God say, God say. We need to judge the position from which they're speaking. And if they're not speaking from any of the established position that Christ has given to the church, we should never listen to them. Because if you do, you are opening yourself up to deception. You're opening yourself up to deception. And the way in which God speaks to Israel from time to time, it even reminded, God even said, if a prophet presume to speak a word in my name and I didn't send that prophet, he said, kill the prophet. And he said, the way in which you're going to know when the prophet is from me is that when the prophet speak a word and the thing that the prophet speak comes to pass, then it's from me. But if the prophet speak the thing and it didn't come to pass, you know that it's not from me. So Israel knew that whoever they're going to receive the word from must be in the position of a prophet. Today, what position are positions that God has established where the church is concerned. We are all over the place. We're slack. We're doing. And, and you know what? I've looked, when, I, when, I, when I look back at the church, from the time that I've been born again and come to be a part of the denomination that I was a part of for a number of years, you, you hear the church talk a lot about order. And it sounds good and you, you know, some people feel good that you know, they're talking about order. They, they're, they're saying order. So order is here. And I hear, hear, me, hear me carefully now. I am not saying that there is no order. But the question is, whose order is it? Is it God's order? Or is it man's order? And I'm here to say to you, based on what I have seen for over 30 going 40 years in the church, and looking and paying careful and serious attention to the word of God, I surround my life with the word of God left, right, and center. Day and night, I surround myself with the word of God. And when I use the standard, which is the word of God, to judge what I'm seeing, judge what I've observed, judge what I've heard, judge what I've experienced, the church order, what the church is calling order, it is not of God. It is man-made. And if it is of man, it is corrupted. It is, it's leading to death if you ever submit yourself to that order. Because when you think of it, that we have over 40,000 and growing. Because as I said, even during the pandemic, you think that the church will be repenting. People are starting new church. People are starting new this. People, oh, God, God told me to do. God told me to. God, 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 God. God, 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 God. The Lord rebuke you. God didn't tell you that. God didn't say it. It's demons. Because you know what it's doing? Whatever you're a part of and doing, it's promoting confusion. It's promoting division. And if it's pro promoting confusion and division, it is not of God. God is not the author of confusion. He's a God of peace. He's a God of order. And the Bible tells us, let everything be done decently and in order and the question is whose order God's order the next question is what is God's order for the church for his church I'm not talking about the church that man have made and man continue to sustain and, and, and put it on life support and people, it's the people who give that kind of a church power. I'm talking about the church that Jesus Christ established and he is the source, he is the basis of power and authority for that church. Because you see the church of Jesus Christ, the gates of hell shall not, cannot and will not prevail against it. But man's church... 
No human power can overcome the gates of hell. Only the power of the living, resurrected Christ. It's time for the church to repent. And so what God has been doing in using me to talk about the apostle, as I said, many of you have been confused about it, the apostle, because when I listened to God over the period of time that he was preparing me to release this word, and when he said, the apostle, and I'm saying, the apostle, and he began to show me the, the, the importance of the order that he has put in place for the church, in light of its manifestation where the church is seeing in bodily form what the face of that order looks like. Of course, we know that the source of it, the, the architect of it, if I may use that word, is Christ himself. And so there is a face that he has given to that order for the church to be able to see and know without a shadow of a doubt that once I receive this that I am seeing coming from Christ, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I have this guaranteed hope that that which Christ has put in place to support me, I can't miss it. I can't miss it. Many of us are not taking, to time, taking the time to understand why this is so. Why God has even put these things that he has put in place. The church doesn't know that. So when you talk about the apostle, you're talking about the order that God through Christ, God the Father through Christ the Son has put in place to bring about the divine order that he intends for the church to come into and function from. That's why he had me talking about and still talking about the apostle. Right? The apostle. It starts with the apostle. <laughs> I said... The divine order that God put in place where the church is concerned, it starts with the apostle. It starts with the apostle. And the church doesn't, I, I don't know how many within the church have ever met a true apostle. And I'm talking about the, the present church today. I'm not talking about the, the early church because when we look at the early church, we see the history throughout the book of Acts that the church started by the true apostles and they, they understood the importance of the apostles. And when we see throughout the book of Acts, as you read, if you, if you, if you recall, the book of Acts is actually titled, this is the title of it, the Acts of the Apostles. Right? So that's why we see the things that took place in the book of Acts happen the way that it happened, on purpose, in alignment with heaven, heaven sanctioning it, heaven bearing witness to it, because the apostles were functioning as true apostles, and the church aligned itself, and they were experiencing the economy that God had put in place to support the church. And today, when you look at the present church today, how many within the church have ever met, experienced a true apostle? Because true apostles are still here today. They are necessary for what God is doing where the church is concerned and what he wants to accomplish. So those who have been deceived, blind, to say that there is no apostles for today, the last apostle, you know, ceased to be when John died on the Isle of Patmos, it, it, the apostleship is over. Come on, people, go back and look at the word and stop listening to some tradition and some teaching that came from doctrines of devil and not from the living God. Use the word to judge everything that we believe. Use the word to judge everything that you believe. What you hear, use the word to judge it. And make sure that you're not twisting the word, but the word is rightly divided. Rightly divided. 
It is the word of truth. And if you wrongly divide it, the same word will judge you. So, last week I end with Hebrews chapter 1. And I looked at Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus Christ took Peter, James, and John and he went up into the mount and was transfigured before them. In chapter 16 of Matthew and the latter part of it, Jesus said, there are some of you standing here that will not taste of death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And the Bible said in chapter 17, how many days later, he took Peter, James, and John that was standing there in chapter 16. And so they did not taste of death and he took them and bring them up into the mount with him. And he was transfigured before them. They saw his glory. They saw Moses and Elijah speaking with him. And in that moment that everything was happening, the Bible said Peter did not know. They did not know what they should say. So Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, three thrine, shrine. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. The Bible said immediately, you notice immediately a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the, the cloud saying to them, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear, hear, hear him. You know, many of us, we hear that and we take it lightly. I've been talking about that for a long time and it's taken lightly. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't move us. It doesn't shift us. It doesn't cause us to repent. It doesn't cause us to check ourselves and to understand the seriousness of this thing. You notice when he said what is immediately the cloud overshadowed him and the voice because of the seriousness of this. We still don't get it. We still don't get it. We don't judge who we listen to. We don't even care who we listen to. We listen to everybody, anybody, because we want to show them that we're nice. Forgetting that there is an enemy of God. And when there is an enemy involved in the equation of anything that is happening, you cannot play nice. You cannot say, oh, you know, I'm going to be nice. No, you have got to discern. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be sober, vigilant, because your adversary, your adversary, you notice what the Bible is saying to you? Your adversary, the devil, is going around like a roaring lion looking for an opportune time to devour you. And one of the ways that he devours you is things through words, things that are spoke that have been spoken. So the Bible says, do not believe every spirit. Try the spirits. Test the spirits to see if they are of God or not. No. How many in the church is doing that? We're listening to everybody on the television. We're listening to everybody on radio. Joy 1250, uh, 100 Huntley Street. We, we're listening to everything that, you know, they open up a Bible. Oh, it, mu they, it, they, it must be of God because they're preaching the Bible. They're talking, the devil, the devil, the devil knows scripture. The devil quotes scriptures. The devil is a preacher too. The Bible said, do not believe every spirit, but try them, test them to see if they are of God or not. And he give us the acid test. God didn't raise up the church to play around. There is an enemy. There is an enemy. And when there is an enemy, you cannot play around. Mm. 
And that's why over the years, many have not liked me. I don't care, really. As long as I haven't done anything wrong, as long as I haven't committed any sin or anything, because I know that if I do, I need to correct it, I need to repent, but I haven't. I'm standing up for the truth, standing on the word, standing for what Christ, saying what God wants me to say, doing what he wants me to do. Then he says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Hear this. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven. So it doesn't matter. But that's one of the reasons why I come under certain things and come up against certain things because I refuse to compromise. I refuse to back up. I refuse to back down. I refuse to accept anything that is outside of the divine order. Anything that is outside of the standard of God, the church, the true church must reject it because you're either on the side of God or you're on the side of darkness. Jesus said, those who are not for me, there's no middle ground. They are against me. And we see a church today in the world that has adapted the cultures of the world to show the world around it that we are nice. We are nice. And you're welcome. You can come and, and we'll be a part of you and you'll be a part of us. And we get married. And you know, there is, a, there is a relationship going on here. And there is an affair going on between the church and the world. <laughs> and the Bible forbids such a relationship. The Bible says, come out from among them. The Bible still says, light and darkness cannot fellowship. The Bible still says, how can you eat and partake of the, from the table of God and the table of Baal at the same time? No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And we're preserving ourselves. That's why we're behaving the way we're behaving. And so, I want to... I want to show you a little more building on what I looked at last week when we look at Matthew chapter 17 and saw what happened there when Jesus transfigured in front of the three disciples and they didn't know what to say and they said what they said and the father rebuked them and said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased here only him. Now in Hebrews chapter 1, connecting to Matthew chapter 17, God who at various times in various ways spoke to our fathers in time past by the prophets. And watch this, verse 2. In these last days he's speaking to us through his son. That's what we see here in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 17 and it's in Mark chapter 9 and so on. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear only him. Because if you notice... After the cloud was taken up, the Bible said they saw nobody else. So Moses wasn't there anymore. Elijah wasn't there anymore. They saw Jesus only. So they, the message was clear that the, the prophets ended because Elijah represented the prophets. The law has now ended because both the law and the prophets was meant pointing to Christ coming. And so when Christ came, Christ is the fulfillment of the law and Christ is the fulfillment of the prophets and the prophecies. Therefore, it's what the prophecy was pointing to and what the law was pointing to. Once that which it is pointing to come, you no longer look at the law and the prophets. You look at what the sign was pointing to. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Romans chapter 10 tells us that. Christ is the end of the law. So Moses gone, Elijah gone, and the father said, this is my beloved son. Before the son showed up, he was talking through Moses. He was talking through the law. Before the son showed up, he was talking to the prophet. You notice even where John the Baptist was concerned. In Matthew chapter 11, and in Luke chapter 16, and, 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 in, and in Mark, it says that the law and the prophet was until John. 
But from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom is preached. The kingdom is preached. Not the law, not the prophets. It's the kingdom. And the kingdom comes to us in the person of the Son. So Hebrews chapter 1 says, In these last days, he's speaking to us through his Son. So we see the Father establish the divine order in, in, which, in the way in which he would deal with Israel, speak to Israel, guide Israel, um, and enable them to function in the way that he wants them to, being the weakness that he wanted them to be. We saw that the prophets was integral to that truth. Now, in the New Testament, as I said, now starting out with Matthew chapter 17, we see what was said when Jesus was transfigured. So we know that a lot of things that Jesus taught and preached and did before the cross, when he died on the cross, these things were now ratified and established for the church to come into and function from that position. So when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear he him. That's before the cross. We now understand that even after the cross, that is now established going forward how the father would speak to the church is through the son. Now speaking through the son, the son has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And the authority that is given to the son is so that the son will do what he wants. Now, what the son wants is not what the son wants. What the son wants is what the father wants. So anything that the son is doing is exactly what the father wants because the son is one with the father. And the church is called into oneness with the son, which brings us into oneness with the father. So now, the authority that is given to the son to represent the father, what did the son do with that authority in establishing a divine order through which the son, the father is speaking through the son to the church. So now we know that these things that have been put in place is meant to be the way in which the son would speak to us from the father. I am going to I remember when I started out in January coming, going through the process of talking about the apostle, I went a little through these passages that I'm going to go back and look at. I want you not to allow familiarity to cause you to miss what you should hear and what you should see. Because when it comes to the things of God, when you think about the, the spirit, even when something is repeated, it's not the same thing that was said before is being said. It's not a mere reashing of what was said previously. There is more that is coming forth. There is more revelation. But if you don't open up yourself with that attitude, you're simply hearing the same thing and thinking that you're hearing the same thing. Therefore, you're going to get the same thing. But if you understand that the word of God is alive, it's, it's moving, that it's not the same thing. So you open yourself to hear more and more will be given unto you. I want to go to Matthew chapter 10 and be begin to see now why we're reading what we read in Matthew chapter 10 and the other passages that I will look at. And even if I didn't get to go to the others tonight, I am going to continue with them. Because the church needs to hear this. The church needs to hear this. And I'm giving myself to God so that whomever he needs to bring into this and draw them into it, they will come into it. Whoever refuse to come into it and hear it, then... The judgment is already established. So I want you to look at this. And, and I, th I thought about it and I said, how long I've been reading this and never really saw the fullness of it until God began to open my eyes to see that there was a divine, there was a set order in, in, in how he dealt with Israel and speaking to them and doing whatever he did with them. 
and never did anything out of that order. Never. Therefore, the New Testament is established in a divine order also. Because there is an enemy. And the order protects. Order protects. When a thing is, is, is made, is designed, is built, is manufactured, there's an order in, 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 in how you, you, you deal with that thing. And I notice there are different types of uh, facial tissue in different sizes, different shapes. That you have this um, rectangle looking box. You have some that is perfectly square. You have some that is much smaller and so on. Different, 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 different. Packet different than the company. But the paper inside is, is, is put together. I, I don't know. I've never really looked at that. But it's possible that it's a machine that folds the papers and put them together in a way. And what I noticed, there, there are those couple moments in time where you pull one of the, the thing and you pull the paper wrongly. And, and when you pull it, you find that it's not coming. And if you pull it out, you realize it, it tear. And, and you keep on pulling it, and it, it keeps coming out and not coming out freely because it is designed that once you pull the, the box and you, you pull the, the right one, it's folding in a way that once you pull it, it's going to leave another space, and you pull, and it's going to leave another space, and you pull, and it's going to do that until the last one. But if you never pull it properly, you end up struggling, and sometimes you find an, a certain an amount coming out that you don't want to come out at the time because you're not following the order. Everything around us, even in the natural, is meant to function in a particular order. And if you step away from the order, you're going to have chaos. Things are not going to work properly. Electricity that is coming to your house. There is an order that they put in place to bring that electricity to your house and then it comes to your house and there's an order in which electricity, electricity is set in your house and designed. There is, there is black wire, there is white wire, there is red wire. In, in some cases there is green wire, there is copper wire and all of those wires have their order, have their place in how they work. And if you ever go and mess with that thing and put wire where wire not supposed to go you can burn down the place and kill yourself but we think God a puppy show and we think God is a joke church you need to repent we must repent and come back to the divine order judgment is still ahead of us there is a judgment day coming. As a matter of fact, if there was no order, why would they, why? you cannot have judgment where there is no order? If there was no set standard, you can't have any judgment. The judges that are judging the games in the Olympics, if there is no standard, what, what we, what we have judge, what? judges that are judging the, the football game, the, the soccer game, the, the, the tennis game. You have the judges on the side and they're watching. They know the standard. They know the rules. And they're watching the players and making sure that the players are abiding by the rule. And they're judging the game. And at the end of the day, as the players play and stay within the rules, they come to the point where one wins the game and is going to take the trophy home. The Bible even tells us that if you're running in a race and you didn't abide by the rule and the discipline, you're going to be disqualified when you come to the end. In Galatians, the question is asked, you have run well, but who have entered you or who did enter you from not obeying the truth they're ordered everywhere we turn but when we look at the church the order of God is rejected the order of God is rebelled against the order of God is debate debated and 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 and, and who win the debate that's the one we think now that they are whatever as I said last week I end saying 
there is no debate in a kingdom. In a kingdom, the king, notice it's monarch, one rule. Monarch, mano, one. It's not sterile, it's mano. So in a kingdom, there's no debate. The king says what he wants, says what he means, and it is obeyed and carried out. What is the divine order that God put in place for his church? And I want to show you in Matthew chapter 10. And I, I begin to appreciate this passage because as I said, I heard it read over the years. I've read it myself, reading through the Bible and so on. And it never really take its rightful place it sound good you know it's nice reading this thing and we see jesus saying certain things and doing certain things but why was he doing it why was he doing it because he's the one that the father is speaking through and he has now put things in place so that as the father speak through him this is it's coming down through this medium to the church God in these last days has spoken to us, the church, by his son. So what has the son done to make sure that we know that he, the son, is speaking to us? The father is speaking through the son to us. In Matthew chapter 10, the first, um, the first five verses and... Uh, I'm not going to finish all of verse 5, but starting from verse 1, he says, And when he, Jesus, had called his 12 disciples. Now, he did not have 12, only 12 disciples. He had way more than 12 disciples. But these 12, we're going to see that because of the order that the Father has now, is now bringing into play, for how he would speak through the son to the church, this is why he's taking 12 out of all the disciples that he had following him. And we know, based on what we saw in Luke 9 and 10, the Bible tells us in Luke 9, and he called the 12 and he sent them out. And then in 12, verse chapter 10, he said, and he called another 70 disciples unto himself. Wow, another 70 so we never got the total number of disciples that he had in total, but we know that there were more than 12. In, in John chapter 6, when Jesus was talking about, unless you eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, you will have no life. And the Bible said many of his disciples got up and walked away that day and never followed him again. And he turned to the 12 and said to them, aren't you also going Go, go, going, you know, aren't you going to go to? And, 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 and Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go when you alone have the word of eternal life and we are sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we know there, more, there were more than 12. But why 12 here? And why these 12? We're going to see the reason why. And it's a part of the divine order of how God would deal with the church. Hear me. Those of you watching the live stream now and those of you that are going to come on after the live stream, whether it's later on tonight or tomorrow or next week or whenever, hear me. Hear me. Those of you who fear God, hear me. It says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and disease and all kinds of disease. We saw the master himself went about with that power healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of... Now the 12 that he called, he's giving them the same power to go and do the same thing. But who are these 12? Verse 2. Now, the names of the 12 apostles, now you see, in verse 1, he said he called the 12 disciples unto him, and he gave them power. And now we see in verse 2, the purpose 
that they have now been placed into being called in that order. It says, now the name of the 12 apostles. So in verse 1, we see 12 disciples. In verse 2, 12 apostles. So the 12 disciples are now purposed to be apostles. I am talking about the apostle. And when I talk about the apostle, I am referring to the apostleship. The order of the apostle. I'm not focusing on an individual. I'm talking about the order of the apostle. That whoever comes into that, what is the purpose of it? Why did God give that gift to the church? As I asked the question from my started in January. Why did Christ give the gift of the apostle to the church? Come on church. Some of you may not like me, but you better like God. You better love God and you better obey God. Some of you may not want to hear me, but you better hear God. He called 12 disciples and the name of the 12 apostles. Watch this. The name of the 12 apostles. So now we know the 12 disciples were now purposed to be apostles. The name of the 12 apostles are these. First, first of the apostles, Simon Peter. Second, it says Simon, who is called Peter. Second, Andrew, Simon's Peter brother. Third, James. Fourth, um, John, and they were brothers, sons of Zebedee. And then we see fifth, Philip. Sixth, Bartholomew. Seven, Thomas. Eighth, Matthew, the tax collector. Nine, John, the son of Alphaeus. Ten, Libyus, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon, eleven, and twelve, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So the one who betrayed him was chosen and purposed to be one of the twelve first apostles. Right? Now, if we notice something here, based on what we read in Hebrews chapter 1, but God in these last days is speaking to us through the Son. Notice who chose these persons to be apostles. The Son. And notice what we read in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, that the Son, after he died, and, and, and all the things that took place in his death, and what was supposed to be accomplished, was accomplished. And the Bible said, he who ascended first descended, and then he ascended, and when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. And the Bible tells us in verse 11 of, of Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some to be apostles. And we saw that before the cross, he chose 12. And we know that after the cross, he continued to give some to be apostles. Because Paul, Saul, became an apostle. Silas became an apostle. Barnabas became an apostle. Timothy became an apostle. And many others we see. Even James, the brother of Jesus, who did not believe in Jesus before the cross. So after Christ died and rose from the dead, James became an apostle. We saw that in the book of Acts. The brother of Jesus Christ. Paul talked about him even in, in Galatia. He said, when I went up to Jerusalem and, and saw the brother of James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was a part of the apostleship. So there he continued to make apostles or give apostleship to others after the cross. But these were chosen before the cross and there was a reason for that because on the day of Pentecost, these stood up, these stood up and gave witness to the resurrection of the risen Christ, the risen King, and for the church to understand what is happening now. And we saw what happened on the day of Pentecost. There were over 3,000 that were convicted. They were pricked to their conscience when they heard the witness of the apostle Peter. And they were baptized. Over 3,000, the scripture said, was added to the church that day. And when the apostles went forth and the man was healed, Peter, James, um, um, Peter and John healed the man. There was another, uh, another what, 4,000 that was added. And the number keep on going. And it was all through the workings of the apostles that that was taking place. The divine order 
for the New Testament church. What is it and what does it look like? The church have stepped away from it and the time has come that the church must repent. So we see here that Jesus Christ, he the son through whom the father will only speak to the church. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Here only him. And we see that because he's the one that the father is now speaking to because in Hebrews chapter one, verse four, it tells us that the father created the world through the worlds through him and continue to uphold all things by the power of his word. The son is the one that the father is, do, is doing everything through. So in, in the son choosing the apostles, as I said, it is up in accordance with the father's will, the father's pleasure, and the apostles start the divine order through whom he would speak to the church, bring the message of the kingdom, maintain the order of the kingdom, display the power of the kingdom, so that the saints would have this hope and this blessed assurance that they are in right alignment with the order of heaven and everything that is necessary for them to experience and come into, it will happen on purpose. It will happen on purpose. Not by you trying and doing some things and trying to conjure up some things and think that because you cry or because you say certain things, God is going to do it. But based on the order that you submit yourself to, you know that certain things must happen, must come to pass, must manifest, must support you, must An order allows that to happen. So the order that is set up for the electricity in your house, you know that when you take a plug and you walk over to the, 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 the wall socket, the, 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 the outlet, and you plug, you're expecting that there must be power coming from that to support the device that you're plugging into it. Because that, there's an order that you're giving yourself to here. And if you did that and no power, you're wondering, what happened? Something is out of order. And immediately, you are thinking, what is it that needs to be done now to correct it? And if you're not capable of dealing with it, you're going to sort out, you're going to search out and look for someone that is qualified to come and see to it. Why is it that this outlet is not working? Why is it that this light is not working? Why is it that this thing is not working? And they're going to check and they say, oh, you know, this is that. And such, maybe there's something that burn out or that. And they fix it. And it's, the order is back in place working the way that it should. Come on, church. For years, for centuries, the church has been out of order. And the time has come. The time has come. The time has come. Said God, said God, that the church must come back in order. I am coming for a church without spot and without wrinkle. It must be a glorious church. And in order for it to be a glorious church, the order, the divine order, of God must come back the church must come back to it must receive it again rebuke everything that is out of order reject everything that is out of order and seek first the kingdom of God kingdom is order seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you have need of will be added Unto you, in order, out of order, with order, it is coming to you. Out of the order that is established, it is coming to you. And it must, it must happen. Father, I thank you for another moment in time that we have never seen before. We have never been a part of before. And we will never be a part of it again. As it moves forward, 
something else will happen, something else is coming. And there might be something that is similar to it, but it's different. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your people that you have gathered around this moment from around the world, in so many nations of the world. You're using this medium, you're using this channel to speak to your people, to wake up the church, to, to put the church back in order, to, to get the line in order so that the, the flow of power is not interrupted any longer. Father, I thank you for those who have an ears to hear. They are hearing. I thank you, Lord, that true repentance is taking place. And many of us, Lord, were willing to discard of our old wine skin. And we are coming with new wine skin to receive the new wine so that both are preserved. And so, Father, I thank you for the ministry of the word. I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that those who are hearing that their lives will never be the same again. And I want to remind you, devil, that we are of God and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are not afraid of you. We are not afraid of anything that you can do we're not afraid of anyone that you may use to even come against us because our God our father our king our Lord is greater and you know that he has already commanded us that we should submit ourselves to him resist you and you must flee we're not asking you we are telling you that you have got to run because our Lord is greater his power is greater and so father thank you for whatever it is that your people are facing and going through that you are the greater one living in them and they're overcomers they have already overcome you have already overcome the world you have already overcome that sickness you have already overcome that disease you have already overcome that circumstance or that situation that has showed up against you against your mind your body your spirit your life your family your finance or whatever it is wherever the attack is is showing up you have already overcome it because thanks be unto God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ that's not a joke when Jesus died on the cross he said it is finished it is still finished I said it is still finished I said it is still finished don't you let the devil lie to you remember he's a liar and he's the father of lies. Let God be true. He is a liar and he's the father of lies. And so, Father, I thank you for the truth of your word that is coming from your spirit and heaven. May we align ourselves with the divine order that you have put in place for the church. And because we have rejected the order, we end up with over 40,000 denominations that is creating confusion, division. And all different types of demonic operation that we see manifesting in various ways where the church is concerned. Father, I thank you that you're gathering your people. You're taking your people and you're gathering them and you're putting them in order. So that what you intend to accomplish even in the last days, it must happen. It must be so. And Father, I thank you that even after this live stream stops... The spirit is not stopping. The word is not stopping. I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak and amplify. And as, as, as your people give their time to meditate on what they have heard, I thank you that the Holy Spirit will bring more understanding. I thank you that the Holy Spirit will open their eyes to more. And allow them to see and hear more. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what I fail of asking you, even in this moment, I thank you that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all 
the sanctified ones. Grace, 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 and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, bless you, hug you, squeeze you, and God's willing, I will stand here again in front of these cameras this coming Saturday as we virtually, virtually gather together in a time of fasting, setting food and things aside on purpose and opening ourselves up to heaven, allowing our spirits to continue to become more sensitive to God, to heaven, and the things of heaven. I will be a part of that moment with you in time, God's willing, in your home or wherever you may be available to watch from and be a part of it from, whether it's live or after we stream and you come to watch, you're a part of it. The anointing never gets stale. The anointing doesn't grow whole. The anointing is relevant and fresh with the word for those who come to listen. You'll even go back to listen to something that was teach and preach how many years ago, but in that given moment, it's alive dealing with the present situation that you're facing. So I love you. I bless you. Have an awesome night, an unusual night with the Lord in his presence. As you sleep, may your sleep be sweet. Enjoy the rest of the week. Have an unusual week. And God's willing, as I said, you will see me on Saturday. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm anticipating God continued release and download to you from heaven. Love you. See you soon.